At the very end of the 16th century, here in the Flemish city of Antwerp, a child was born who would grow into one of the greatest artists of his age. Like most citizens of Antwerp, he was raised as a Catholic and, in common with many Flemish artists, his finest paintings included many timeless religious images. But it is not for these that this artist is best known today. Instead, his fame stems from his portraits of the nobility of his day. His name was Anthony van Dyck, and although his work took him away from his homeland, he remains one of the greatest of the Dutch masters. Anthony van Dyck was born in Antwerp on the 22nd of March, 1599, the seventh of 12 children. His family were prosperous textile merchants who had thrived in spite of the conflict that had split the Netherlands into Protestant Holland and Catholic Flanders. We know that by 1609, he was already the apprentice of Hendrik van Balen, a successful local figure painter. He was just 10 years of age. Details of the young Van Dyck's apprenticeship are also sketchy, but it was undoubtedly a good time to be an artist. In the 1610s, a truce between Catholic Flanders and Protestant Holland enabled Antwerp to recover some of its former economic prosperity. Simultaneously, the Catholic hierarchy began to commission a massive body of new religious works for the city's churches. In time, Anthony van Dyck would secure many religious commissions himself. But in the second decade of the 17th century, one Antwerp artist stood head and shoulders above all the rest. One of the greatest painters of all time. A man whose influence van Dyck could not ignore. Peter Paul Rubens. At the moment that Van Dyck came to maturity, which is in the middle of the 1610s, Rubens was extremely dominant. I mean, he'd come back from Italy uh, and settled and become court painter, the, the principal court painter to the Archdukes Albert and Isabella. He had established um, a very large-scale studio in Antwerp. He was also a history painter, so in that sense he practised the most prestigious genre of painting in Antwerp. As the young Van Dyck was growing up, as he was training in the studio of, of Van Balen, what was happening in Antwerp were the great altarpieces of Rubens were going up in the churches of Antwerp, the great erection of the cross in St. Valbucha and the deposition from the cross in the cathedral. And these pictures really transformed religious painting in Flanders and in Antwerp in particular. And this is a new language, a new type of painting which is more ambitious, more Italianate, on a huge scale with a, with a different type of palette and really everything else must have just suddenly seemed old-fashioned, unexciting and dull. And when you compare Rubens to the work of Van Balen, of, of, of Van Dyck's master, you, 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 can, you can see what effect the sight of these great altarpieces by Rubens must have had. We cannot be certain when it was that Rubens and the teenage Van Dyck first became acquainted. While still in his mid-teens, Van Dyck had begun to execute portraits such as the image simply known as Portrait of an Old Man. And this enigmatic self-portrait painted when the artist may have been as young as 14. Perhaps it was these typically northern European images that first alerted Rubens to Anthony van Dyck. Before long, the two men were working together as Van Dyck joined one of the most famous art studios of all time. The important thing to remember is that he wasn't a pupil. He was more like, I suppose we call it a specialist subcontractor, would be a, an analogy in the, from the building trade. He, he worked as a fully paid up master painter, but as a young man in Rubens' studio. And Rubens, we have to remember, r ran a huge enterprise producing paintings um, in huge numbers and, and on a very large scale. 
And uh, Van Dyck was one of the pupils who, not wrong word, one of the assistants who would convert Rubens' ideas into finished paintings. The single most important thing is that he was a prodigy. At 15, Van Dyck was able to do with paint what he wanted it to do. He had an extraordinary technical gift from the very earliest. And this is unlike Rubens. I mean, if you look at the early Rubens, he's often very clumsy, very slow, in, in rather raw colours, clumsy figure drawing. You look at the young Rembrandt. Also, I mean, there's this sense of, of an artist learning his trade. No sense of that with Van Dyck. I mean, he can do it at 15, he can do it at 16, and really he's very confident and because he has this extraordinary technical gift. And what is, to me, particularly fascinating is that you can see in his early work that he's working in his own independent style as an independent artist in Antwerp, and he's also working in the style of Rubens. He's able to move, I mean, such is his technical virtuosity, he's able to move from one style to the other and back again. The young Van Dyck quickly made a favourable impression on his master. In 1618, Rubens described him as the best of my pupils. Two years later, Van Dyck worked as Rubens' chief assistant on a large commission for ceiling paintings for Antwerp's Jesuit church. Sadly, an 18th century fire means that we cannot appreciate their joint effort today but we can see the influence of Rubens in some of Van Dyck's early religious images. In The Mocking of Christ, from around 1620, the powerful musculature is clearly inspired by Rubens, whose own inspiration came directly from classical sculpture. But Van Dyck would take less inspiration from the ancients and from sculptural form as he began to forge his own artistic identity. It may be that, by the time this canvas was painted, Van Dyck was known to the noted English art collector, the Earl of Arundel, and it appears that the Earl was keen to bring the young Flemish artist to work in England. By October of that year, Van Dyck had completed his first journey to London. It would not be his last. I think, if one thinks about his whole, Van Dyck's whole career, that Van Dyck would have been perfectly happy to have stayed in Antwerp, run his, great, his own great international studio serving international clients from Antwerp if it hadn't been for Rubens. And the fact that Rubens was there dominating painting in the city meant that really he had to travel, he had to get away, he had to establish himself in Italy first uh, and then in London. Over the next four months, he familiarised himself with London society and painted a portrait of the Earl of Arundel. The influence of Venetian artists would soon reveal itself in Van Dyck's work. But in the spring of 1621, he was back in Antwerp alongside his master. Significantly, Rubens had spent several years in Italy studying the great works of the Renaissance firsthand and had found particular inspiration in the vibrancy and colour of the Venetians. Van Dyck was fascinated with Venetian painting from a very early point in his career. Even before he ever got to Italy, he was already studying um, Venetian art. Um, he, first of all, he studied um, engravings and works, copies that Rubens had made after Venetian painters. Um, one of the um, crucial uh, points of his visit to England in 1620, his first visit to England, was that it was the first time he was able to study works by the great Venetian masters, Titian in particular, who was his great hero. In Rubens' studio, Van Dyck, I think, had observed that many of Rubens' paintings were based on a kind of sculptural definition of form. What you get from Titian is forms moulded by colour and tone, and those are the lessons that Van Dyck learns from Titian. Soon, Van Dyck would pursue his own artistic mission to Italy. But before he left, he executed this portrait, which shows the beginnings of his mature approach. Here, Van Dyck's personal relationship with Rubens is clearly evident. The woman depicted in this portrait is Isabella Brunt, Rubens' wife. 
but who she is is less significant than how she is depicted. Van Dyck's earliest portraits had been simple, devoid of all but the most basic of settings, and dark to the point of sombre. This portrait is different. The colouring is more striking, the sitter's pose is less rigid, while the incorporation of the uncertain weather and the flowing red drape introduces a sense of movement and life. His very earliest portraits are dated 1618. This, uh, is the, this is the year in which he joined the guild in Antwerp. And these are highly conventional. I mean, they're really in the 16th century format. The format essentially of Antonis Moore, who was the great portrait painter of Antwerp who preceded this generation. They're highly conventional, very static, black and white, you know, face-on, three-quarter length portraits. He then begins to experiment, and what he's interested in really is movement within pictures. So really it's, it's a sense of liberating the Flemish, I mean breaking the Flemish tradition, breaking this very rigid Flemish style and bringing movement and action within the, within the, within the portrait. I mean that's the key really, it seems to me, to Van Dyck's uh, uh, development. He's working in two different manners. He's working in a Rubens manner, um, something that's imitating and improving on Rubens' um, technique. So he's imitating Rubens' sort of um, um, it, Rubens' plasticity of form, roundness of form. But at the same time, um, he was working in a very sort of loose technique um, with loose, dry brushwork. Um, what he does as he becomes a more mature artist is he learns how to bring these two aspects together and so his um, technique becomes more sophisticated. He, he combines something of the oiliness of Ruben's paint with um, the sort of painterly effects of Titian. Um, and so you get a, a greater refinement in, for instance, things like the silks. Um, certainly in the Antwerp period he's also very interested um, particularly in blacks and whites and stark contrasts um, and his flesh tones become increasingly sophisticated. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. We aim to bring you only the most dramatic and fascinating stories of the past through our award-winning documentaries. Find out about the rise of leaders such as Cleopatra and Napoleon in our latest offering of exclusive documentaries. Sign up now for a free trial and perspective fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code PERSPECTIVE at checkout. In the autumn of 1621, Anthony van Dyck once more found himself following in Rubens' footsteps. On the 3rd of October, he left Antwerp and headed south. The following month, he arrived in the wealthy Italian city of Genoa, where Rubens had stayed some 14 years before. This portrait of Elena Grimaldi, the Marchesa Catanillo from 1623, has certain features in common with the earlier image of Rubens' wife. Again, the background climate feels almost animated, and architectural features are included to the right, in this case, Corinthian columns. Early in his career, Van Dyck realized that architectural features and other framing devices produced a strong sense of solidity in his portraits. It would become a recurring feature of his work. Where this canvas differs from the earlier portrait of Isabella Brandt is that the subject is depicted full length and projects an air of nobility to the point of aloofness. The same is true of this image of the Marchesa Balbi, another full length portrait whose overall darkness only serves to emphasize the painter's wonderful handling of gold in the sitter's costume. 1620's Genoa was a tight-knit community of influential families whose wealth generated commissions for portraits of all generations. It was now that Van Dyck executed his first depictions of children with this canvas depicting three boys, 
also members of the Bowlby family. The confident posture of the boy on the left indicates the importance of these Genoese children and their status is further enhanced by an artistic device that would become another trademark of Van Dyck's work. The use of a low horizon line so that the subject seems to rise above the physical environment. Van Dyck's mastery as a colorist can also be appreciated in his Italian work. Golds, whites, blues and reds all contribute to the vibrancy and life of his best portraits, with this image of Cardinal Guido Bentivoglio almost a study in crimson. The richness of the holy man's flowing garments is what first catches the eye, but closer examination also reveals a near-hidden column to the top left of the canvas. In Italy, for the first time, he adopted the Italian style of using very dark grounds. I mean, he worked from dark to light, which is an Italian technique, and this he adopted while he's in Italy. So, in a sense, the figures in his portrait shine out of rather dark backgrounds, and he really worked, he prepared his canvases with what seems like often a dark red ground, and then worked out from, from, from dark to light. Now, later in England, he doesn't seem to, he seems to have abandoned that style and, and goes back to working in the, in the northern style, which is essentially using white grounds and then, you know, and, and, and working too, too dark. So in that sense, there is a technical difference. The range of colours that he uses in, in Italy are very similar to the range of colours he uses when he's back home in Antwerp and then when he goes to goes to England, so there's not any very profound difference there. But of course, he painted what was in front of him, in a sense. I mean, if you think of the rich velvet robes of the Genoese aristocracy, I mean, this is the, the kind of colour, the kind of palette that he adopts, of course, is given by the, by the clothes of, the, of the, the, uh, his sitters. And, I mean, clearly, that sort of very rich and deep and dark colours worn by the Genoese aristocracy is rather different from the kind of colours that we associate with the, you know, the satins and silks of the Caroline court, which tend to be of a much higher tone. In Italy, he does have first-hand contact with Titian and the great Venetian masters um, after him, people like Tintoretto. So this, this direct experience of the kind of colour schemes and the colour ranges that past masters had used that gives Van Dyck the clue on how to incorporate colour into his own portraits. The portrait of Cardinal Bentivoglio was painted by Van Dyck early on in his Italian years, not in Genoa, but in Rome. A stay in the Eternal City itself was essential. Unlike the passionate antiquarian Rubens, Van Dyck showed little interest in classical sculptures. This seeming difference in taste would manifest itself in the two artists' respective approach to their painting. Rubens was primarily more interested in form. Um, so, and he, he collected um, sculpture um, and had a sort of little museum in his house in the Vapistrat. Um, and you can see in his paintings that there is a much greater um, understanding and emphasis on the plasticity of form um, and the way he builds up form in painting. So it gives his paintings a much more powerful presence, if you like, physical presence. Um, Van Dyck was more interested in the surface. So for him, sculpture wasn't such an overriding interest um, and it was for that reason as well that of course he was attracted to um, artists like Titian who concentrated on surface effect rather than three-dimensional effect. Compared with Rubens, the art that Van Dyck sought out in Italy was remarkably specific. His surviving notebooks are dominated by copies of paintings by Veronese and especially Titian the artists of 16th century Venice. Van Dyck's Italian notebooks reveal his artistic interests during his stay in the South, but of his personal experiences, our knowledge is, again, limited. But one contemporary account makes it clear that the artist was already in no doubt as to his social status. He dressed well, sporting a gold chain and a plumed hat, and he travelled in style with a small entourage of servants. 
His biographer described him as acting more like a prince than a painter. And this self-portrait from the time may reveal something of this attitude. Showing the artist dressed as the shepherd Paris, this is undoubtedly an image of self-confidence almost to the point of arrogance. Like Rubens before him, the 25-year-old Van Dyck was well aware of his abilities. But Rubens had never let personal success affect his strong religious faith. And Van Dyck also remained a devoted Catholic throughout his life. His religious images reflect this strong belief. In 1624, he travelled to Palermo in Sicily, only for an outbreak of plague to afflict the city. But as the disease raged, a remarkable discovery was made. The bones of a long-forgotten local saint, Rosalia. Believing this was a sign from God, the citizens prayed to Rosalia to end Palermo's suffering. For whatever reason, the plague was eventually lifted. Van Dyck's response was to create this canvas depicting the saint interceding against the plague. This is a painting more relevant to the everyday life of the time than might first seem apparent. Plague was still a scourge of Europe, and in June 1626, it may have claimed the life of Isabella Brandt, the wife of Peter Paul Rubens. We know that Rubens reacted to his wife's death by throwing himself into diplomatic missions, which took him away from Antwerp for much of the late 1620s. So it was Van Dyck who received many of the best commissions for religious images that were still in demand at the time. For the next five years, he was kept busy creating altarpieces, of which the greatest is surely Madonna and Child enthroned with saints commissioned by a religious brotherhood of which Van Dyck was himself a member. Here we can see the distinctive features of Van Dyck's portraiture applied to deeply spiritual subject matter. The devotion of none other than Saint Rosalia to the infant Jesus held by the Madonna between Saints Peter and Paul. The kneeling saint is clothed in the familiar gold and red but it is the white of Mary's flowing robe that is, perhaps, the greater achievement. The cloudy background and the powerfully architectural framing are also present in a remarkably unified and deeply spiritual canvas. Van Dyck may be best known for his portraits. Images such as this prove that portraiture was just one of his talents. It's very important to remember that, that Van Dyck, although he, in a sense, to, to a modern audience, he's known principally as a portrait painter, he was a great religious painter, a great religious painter of the Counter-Reformation, and I, one of the greatest of all mythological painters. I mean, I think the Cupid and Psyche in the Royal Collection is one of the greatest mythologies of the 17th century, and on a par with Velasquez. I mean, this is, he's a very great painter, and you know, of, of, of non-portraits, as it were, of, of pictures other than, than portraits. Though he is one of the greatest of all Counter-Reformation painters and one of the greatest of, of mythological painters, so I, I rate him extremely highly. When they deal with um, one individual's state of mind, so when, when the painting enables you to focus on what one emotion, or emotion on one character's face, they can be extremely powerful. Indeed. And I suppose you might say that that's more similar to portrait painting. Their weakness is that um, Van Dyck wasn't a particularly original storyteller, so the, the design ideas are seldom original. I mean, for example, in, in Dulwich Bridge Gallery, we have an early Van Dyck, Samson and Delilah, which is very closely modelled on Rubens, Samson and Delilah. And Van Dyck slips in some good ideas and it's beautifully executed, but it isn't, a, it, it isn't an entirely original idea. Rubens was painting from a greater amount of acquired knowledge. Rubens had much more imagination and invention. 
I think that goes down to the fact that he's better educated than Van Dyck. For the student of Van Dyck, the Antwerp years are another period of uncertainty in his personal life. We can be certain that he was already a wealthy man, like his master Rubens. But just as their art displayed subtle differences, so did their personal characters. The amazing self-confidence of Rubens was not wholly matched by Van Dyck, despite his outward trappings of success. He was um, described um, when he was on his Italian travels by Bellori um, as dressing up in the most extravagant dress with golden chains and feathers in his hat with a retinue of servants, um, which thoroughly upset his Flemish contemporaries. And he refused to um, go on their drinking bouts because he obviously wanted um, to be taken as an aristocrat and he liked mixing in aristocratic company and he obviously enjoyed the lavish uh, uh, um, lifestyle that went with that and of course by becoming a portrait painter to the great um, it meant that he could also participate in their lifestyle and a visit later to Van Dyck's studio in England um, was a social event in itself so the sitter would go to the studio not just be sketched, painted by Van Dyck, but it would also have lunch, would listen to a concert, and of course all of this was part of Van Dyck's, um, you know, he actually liked living like that, but also it helped bring in more clients as well, because it became part of the sort of social calendar that you went and had your portrait painted by Van Dyck. During 1629, he had received an unusual commission to depict a scene from Jerusalem Delivered, a remarkable verse epic by the great Italian poet Torquato Tasso. This popular work combined the literary form of the ancient epic with strong contemporary religious sentiment. The resulting canvas shows the characters of the enchantress Armida and the Christian Rinaldo about to be bound by a chain of flowers. It is a stunning piece of work, whose Venetian colouring and mysterious landscape combine to create an otherworldly image almost eight feet square. But Rinaldo and Armida is an important canvas not only for the genius of his execution, but because of the identity of the man who commissioned it. Van Dyck received the commission from Endymion Porter, an Englishman whom he had met during his first stay in London. But Porter himself was only an agent. The real buyer was none other than King Charles I. It was this canvas, more than any other, that made Charles resolve to employ Van Dyck himself. By 1632, the King's wish had come true. That year, Anthony van Dyck became painter to the most artistic court that England had ever known. Charles I was one of the great collectors of painting in Europe at the time. Rubens referred to him as the amateur who understood painting the best amongst all the princes of the world. But of course, changes were taking place in Charles's court. Uh, by the time van Dyck arrived for the second time, the court had become much more sober and reserved. But court entertainment was still very important. The court mask, these official pageants, played a dominant role in shaping the kind of image that Charles's court had. I'm sure the key to the relationship between Van Dyck and Charles I is Titian. I mean, for Charles I, Titian was the most important painter in the world, the greatest painter who'd ever lived, and he saw Van Dyck as Titian reborn. We may never know the precise reasons for Van Dyck's move to England, but the artistic life of Charles' court must have been a hugely influential factor. Further persuasion from Charles included a salary of £200 per year, a substantial home in London's Blackfriars, generous working conditions and a knighthood. Soon the new court painter began to justify the king's largesse and, in so doing, change English portraiture forever. Van Dyck entirely changed 
portraiture in this country. I mean, he really set a new type of portraiture. I mean, there had been Netherlandish artists here before, um, people like Cornelis Johnson, Paul van Soma had worked at the, the court in London, but really they were swept away when Van Dyck arrived. I mean, he was bringing the absolutely the latest type of international court painting. I mean, at a very, very high level, and he really uh, entirely revolutionises portrait painting in this in this country. He then continues to have an extraordinary effect on portrait painting. I mean, Lely, who is the the, the follower of uh, essentially the, the next generation, is of course. You know, bases his whole style on Van Dyck. In, you know, he had this enormous collection himself of paintings and drawings by Van Dyck. And essentially, I mean, he is a Van Dyck follower. And then, generation by generation, I mean, 18th century, I mean, Gainsborough is inconceivable without Van Dyck. Thomas Lawrence is inconceivable without Van Dyck. And then, for example, Sargent came to the great Van Dyck exhibition, which was at the Royal Academy in 1900, and Sargent, you know, becomes more Van Dykian than Van Dyck. So, I mean, he's, he has an extraordinary influence. I mean, really, portrait painting in this country, right up until Sargent, cannot be thought about seriously, I mean, without the influence of, of Van Dyck. Van Dyck invented that peculiarly English form, the Swagger portrait. The Swagger portrait was a full-length portrait, a man or a woman wearing extremely fine clothes, a sense of refinement, and the epitome of good breeding and good manners. And of course, more than a touch of arrogance as well. He, in some ways, inscribes desire into the, the, the picture in a way that just hadn't been there in English portraiture before. However rich the costumes had been, however many jewels and little buttons and, um, I don't know, laces there'd been on these Tudor portraits, the, the sheer beauty um, of the surfaces uh, wasn't there. So I think he brings that to um, English portraiture. After his appointment to King Charles, for the rest of his career, Van Dyck concentrated almost exclusively on portraiture, with Charles himself inevitably the subject matter on many occasions. This famous painting shows the English monarch proudly riding through an arch in the manner of an equestrian Roman emperor. The canvas is some 12 foot by 9 in size, and was originally hung at the end of a hall in a London palace, further emphasising Van Dyck's ability to bring figures out from the canvas. With this unusual triple portrait of the king from 1635, the artist again captured the essential nobility of the English monarch, but with a greater sense of humanity, even to the point of vulnerability. This feeling can be detected in a number of Van Dyck's portraits, and many believe it reflects a certain uncertainty within the artist's own character. But in this case, there is also the intriguing possibility of doubt within the king himself. Political storm clouds were already gathering over his nation. Just seven years after this canvas was painted, England was plunged into the horrors of civil war. But with the most famous of Van Dyck's images of Charles, also from 1635, there is little in the way of uncertainty or doubt about the king. Now situated in the Louvre, Paris, this canvas of Charles hunting remains the finest visual reminder of this most ill-fated of all English kings. The Louvre portrait of Charles shows him as a huntsman. Um, he's standing with a walking stick, swaggering again. And on the right-hand side, we've got his horse. The horse is bowing its head very decorously. And you've got two grooms as well. This is the image of Charles as the most refined, the most elegant courtier in the country. It was sent to France as a diplomatic gift. And of course, the attributes of horsemanship and hunting were an international language and international currency. It's somewhat informal. It's somewhat relaxed. I mean, this is a royal portrait, and yet it, it's, it really has a very relaxed uh, um, scent, a feeling about it, it seems to me. It's it, far less formal than the great equestrian portraits in the National Gallery or in the, in the royal collection. 
Um, it's really the beauty in the way, the way it's painted, not just in this extraordinary painting of the, the clothes that he's wearing, these marvellous buff colours that are, that are used by Van Dyck, um, also the pose of the, I mean, the horse too, but also this marvellous landscape that, that goes away on the left-hand side, I mean, this extraordinary view into, into distance. And it's really this combination of the, it seems to me, of the relaxation of the, of the picture, the non-formality of a royal portrait, the glorious painting, which is so much what Van Dyck does best, of the textures of the uh, fabrics that the king is wearing, of the clothes that the king is wearing, and then this marvellous recessive landscape on the left-hand side of the picture. This is a sovereign who believed he ruled by divine right, a monarch at the head of a court whose members felt themselves utterly removed from the lives of the common people. This was the world painted by Van Dyck in England, and he did his job so well that it is now his portraits that, more than anything, define that world for us today. In this canvas, depicting Queen Henrietta, we can see a feature that appeared time and again in Van Dyck's portraits. The Queen's hands are unusually long and slender, positioned in an unusually drooping manner that succeeds in further emphasising the status of the sitter. At this date, for a, a nobleman or woman, one of the most important things is their deportment, the fact that they stand in the right way. And standing in the right way doesn't just mean your, you know, your feet, it, it, your shoulders, whatever. It means the whole of your body should be disposed in a, an elegant and graceful fashion. And uh, so just in the way that a hand falls, you can tell that somebody is aristocratic rather than being bourgeois. What he um, did with his figures in general was to um, elongate them and make them more elegant. And of course this is the, what you find in his hands as well, that they're painted um, on purpose. He makes the hands very sort of long and elegant, tapering fingers, um, which add to a sort of impression of sensitivity and refinement in his sitters. Um, here you can see that he's on purpose used the hands um, to say something about the sitter. So one hand is placed on a sword, so you immediately know that the sitter must be a gentleman because any gentleman carried arms. Um, and it's kept in quite an active gesture, so it gives you a feeling of the man being a man of action. Um, and the other hand is used in an almost contradictory gesture, fondling the dog's ear. So it shows that, okay, this chap may be a man of action, but he's also sensitive as well. Both of these um, were requisites of the ideal courtier, according to etiquette books of the period, such as Castiglione's The Courtier. So Van Dyck is on purpose using the hands to say something about his sitter in a very sophisticated, subtle way. Van Dyck may have painted as many as 50 canvases of the English royal family, and artistic devices to enhance their visual status can be repeatedly seen, even in his paintings of the royal children. The boy in the centre of this image is the Prince of Wales, later to become Charles II. The Mastiff dog is almost as big as he is, but the boy prince is undeniably in control, entirely appropriate for a future ruler of his nation. But Van Dyck's English portraits depicted more than just the ruling Stuart family. He was on intimate terms with many of the greatest noblemen of the age, all of them keen to be depicted in the so-called grand manner, of which Van Dyck was now a master. Here we see the Earl of Warwick, typically depicted full length. His nobility is immediately apparent, but the portrait is in no way stiff. By now, Van Dyck was able to convey a sense of relaxation in posture without losing the dignity of the subject. In this case, a nobleman with many years' experience at sea, a fact emphasized by the fighting ships in the background. By now, Van Dyck was a leading figure in London society. 
the sheer number of commissions forced Van Dyck to develop a studio system where much of the actual painting was carried out by assistants, very much in the manner of Rubens' old Antwerp studio. But some critics of Van Dyck believe that despite a very efficient division of labor, the artist still took on too heavy a workload. As evidence, they point out that there is a great deal of similarity between many of his later women figures. With the benefit of hindsight, it is possible to see that some of Van Dyck's later work is not in the same class as his greatest masterpieces. This 1636 image of the Earl of Derby and his wife is an example. It lacks much of the vibrancy of his greatest portraits, with the Countess herself now virtually a character type rather than an individual. For many critics, it is the masterful depiction of her white satin dress that is the artist's greatest achievement here. But it is testament to Van Dyck's ability that the pressure of his workload in the late 1630s did not affect the popularity of his work. We know as he became more popular and more sought after, Van Dyck had to employ assistants. So he hands over some of the drapery painting. So the drapery is not so animated in some of the portraits and the colour becomes weakened as well. The royal portraits, it seems to me, are all by the hand of the master himself. Essentially, I think this is a very practical matter. You got what, you're, what you paid for. I mean, if you were the king, you got the artist himself, unsurprisingly, or the queen. If you were part of the sort of intimate circle of the, of the, of the king, then you, you pretty much got the artist himself. If, on the other hand, you lived in Suffolk and you were just in town that week and you didn't want to pay very much money, then you got your head done by Van Dyck and the rest done by a member of the studio. I mean, I think he, essentially he was very practical. I mean, he was a very practical working artist. And he, you know, there was a scale of charges. And you basically paid more if you got the man himself, and you paid less if you got, if you got the drapery done by members of the studio. The great and the good still clamoured to be painted by him. And there is little evidence of any customer dissatisfaction. One countess did complain that Van Dyck had made her look fat in one canvas, but this was hardly a typical response. Van Dyck was not a warts and all portraitist. What's the difference between enhancing one's features, bringing them out more clearly, and that nasty word, flattery, with it, which somehow um, means that you're disguising bad, you know, the badness of something. So I think it's a very, very complicated issue. And um, it's certainly true that People, when they saw Van Dyck, when they saw the original sitters of Van Dyck's portraits, were very struck by how beautiful he made people look. It is not difficult for the modern critic to look on Van Dyck as a portraitist who flattered his subjects. But we should not judge artistic attitudes of the 1630s by the standards of our own time. In England, Van Dyck supplied a specific service to wealthy people grew wealthy himself as a result, and left a remarkable artistic legacy in the process. This includes a canvas that, for many, is the greatest of all his English works. It is certainly the biggest. This is a depiction of the Earl of Pembroke and his family. Pembroke was a great enthusiast for Van Dyck's work, and in 1635, he commissioned a painting that would express the high status of his whole family. The following year, Van Dyck completed a huge group portrait. It is a canvas almost 11 feet in height and some 16 foot in length. The Earl of Pembroke and his family. Well, I think the thing to remember here again is the, the interests of the English patron. And what they want is a dynastic image. Uh, showing them and their heirs lined up in order of seniority. And in effect, I think what would be in the mind of the patron would be something like those tombs you see where, you know, you have the father and the mother praying like this, and then a whole line of daughters, like, like little dolls all lined up, all praying, the girls that side, the boys that side. And if you can imagine something as... as um, inelegant as that. 
uh, being in the mind of the patron. Well, Van Dyck supplied that, basically, but he's just made it incredibly elegant. The Pembroke family, I think, is astounding by its sheer size. It's 15 by 11 feet, and the figures are just about life size. It shows the fourth Earl of Pembroke and his wife seated, surrounded by his sons and their daughter, and also the husband and wife of the family. There's always a great problem composing a group portrait. How do you fit so many figures in together? The solution that Van Dyke comes up with is putting them on stairs, so they stand at different levels so their head height is varied. And of course, this Pembroke portrait is still in the Pembroke family. It's still at Wilton House. Some people, when they've looked at the Earl of Pembroke, have thought that he looked a bit shifty. And in fact, we know that he changed sides during the English Civil War. I find it fascinating because he's really brought the technique of a Venetian history painting, of a great religious painting by, by Titian to English portraiture, which is a revolutionary step uh, at that moment. By the time this monumental image was completed, Van Dyck was one of London society's leading figures. There were rumours of romantic liaisons with some of his female sitters, but his only verifiable relationship was with the tempestuous Margaret Lemon. This was a woman described as being prone to jealousy, who once grew so envious of Van Dyck's female subjects that she tried to bite his thumb off to stop him painting again. Happily, her attempt at disfigurement failed, and on the 27th of February, 1640, Anthony Van Dyck was able to put this dubious figure behind him. That day, he married Mary Ruthven, a lady-in-waiting to Queen Henrietta, here painted by her husband playing the cello. They appear to have been happy together, and the following year she fell pregnant. A settled family life of his own now beckoned for Anthony van Dyck, but tragically it was not to be. At the time of the van Dyck's wedding, the bridegroom was already a sick man. It is likely that tuberculosis was the cause. A desperate King Charles offered 300 pounds to the doctor who could cure his great portraitist, but medicine could do nothing. On December the 9th, 1641, eight days after the birth of his only legitimate daughter, Anthony van Dyck died in London. He was just 42 years of age. His early death remains a tragedy of art history but there is an undeniable aptness in its timing. Within the year, the English society that he had depicted so memorably also died, split asunder by the horror of civil war. Just over seven years later, Van Dyck's great patron, Charles I, was also dead, executed by the victorious parliamentary forces of Oliver Cromwell and the divine right of kings died with him. As a politician, Charles I was undoubtedly a flawed figure, but his passion for the arts led to some of the greatest ever work by a Dutch master being created in the capital city of England. Right up to the 20th century, the work of Anthony van Dyck was the dominant influence on English portraiture, as can be seen clearly in the works of Gainsborough, Reynolds and others. But in considering the career of Van Dyck, we should not forget his earlier achievements. In Antwerp, and especially in Italy. His talent revealed itself in the early 17th century. 400 years later, it is still admired across the world.